uh, my first year of university. It was a cool time. I did enjoy going to uni up in Leeds, uh, and I went on a church weekend away. My first year there, and, and the church I went to, they did quite a lot of student work, which is really cool. And so basically the students at the church, we went on like a weekend away, um, and we're staying in a couple of old farmhouses in the middle of the Yorkshire Dale. So you can picture like this beautiful scenery. I mean, there's like, it's one of those things where there's like no lamp, you know, no street lamps or anything. So when you're walking from one house up the road to the other one, it is literally pitch black and it's awesome. You can see the stars and, and it's, it's January. So it's like really, it's fresh, fresh, you know, it's like, it's fresh. We all know it's like in January. But anyway, even better than the amazing scenery was, was a great time of fellowship and Bible study and being able to really dig into some teaching and, and from the teaching, which was really encouraging, it was all about real discipleship. What does it mean to really follow Jesus? Um, and there were a couple of like these little cards which had quotes which they'd give us kind of for each session, um, of which I have most still tucked away in my old Bible. And one of them says this. Let me read it to you. And this is by a, a Zimbabwean uh, a Christian, uh, a martyr. He says this, I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit's power. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the enemy, pander at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stops. And when he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear. I love just that radical statement of, man, I've given my life to Jesus. And I want to follow him with everything that I have. And we quickly forget, and I've heard one pastor say this once, salvation costs us nothing. But in some ways, discipleship will cost us everything. True discipleship, true laying down of ourselves. The radical call to follow Christ is not going to be one of comfort, but rather it's going to be one which will require courage. And that's going to be our theme today as we kind of look at Joshua and our life, an event in his life. Joshua, the successor of two Moses, and this man, we're going, to, we're going to see in this man of God, he's going to find himself in a place where he faces a great challenge and an opposition lying in front of him. And God in his grace is going to meet with Joshua God in his grace is going to speak to Joshua and he's going to give him the call to be strong and the call to be courageous. So if you've got a Bible, turn to Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9. So Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9, where it says this. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Moses, my servant, is dead. Oh, sorry, guys. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. Did I, did I give you the wrong chapter? Did I say verse 9? We're going up to verse 9, that's why. See, I'm, I'm glad you're paying attention, guys. You're being attentive, that's good. <laughs> so we're in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1, but we will get to verse 9, sorry. Let me read that again. Thank you for noticing, guys. It's good, it's good. Right, let me read that again. So Joshua 1 and verse 1 says this. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory, and no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. 
I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Before we look at the events going on here with Joshua, we want to set a little bit of a background and I want to briefly look at Moses. Moses, one of the big figures of the Bible, as we see he passes away at the end of the previous chapter. And the people are in mourning and as they say goodbye to their leader. And when people pass away, it naturally becomes a time of reflection, a time when you look back at the impact that somebody has had on your life. You know, if you were to think even recently, or maybe somebody you've known who's passed away, it's often a time when you reflect on who they are and, and what kind of person they were and what kind of difference they made to your life. And looking at Moses' life, if you had to sum up in one sentence his life, Kind of the main, the, kind of the main difference, or the main kind of aspect, or the main thing that came to mind of his life. What would it be? What would be that standout moment, or that standout event, that or standout char- characteristic? Would it be the parting of the Red Sea? Would it be leading the people out of Egypt? Maybe the Ten Commandments, or giving the rest of the law, or maybe it's looking at those movies and the classic beard that he has. What is it that stands out to you about Moses? And the list could go on and on about who he is. And for me personally, it's not not the beard, don't worry. For me personally, one verse perfectly sums up who he is uh, and the kind of and the kind of man he was. In Exodus 33:11, uh, it says this. One of my favorite verses in Scripture says this. And thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. And then it says, when Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. For me, Moses was a man known and remembered for his relationship with God, a man who actually got to meet and speak with God face to face, just as a man speaks with his friend. And just think about how amazing that statement is, this idea that, Moses has such a relationship that it was, it was face-to-face as, an, any, as any of us would speak to a friend. And think for a second. Imagine thinking, think of, I want you to think of somebody you admire, somebody you look up to and, and you haven't had the chance to meet yet. So maybe it's somebody famous, you know, in a, in a particular sport or field where you're like, man, that, that person I really look up to, I really acknowledge kind of just how amazing they are in this particular field or in this I want you to think, imagine how you would feel if you had the chance to meet face to face with that person. Maybe it's somebody who's royalty or maybe somebody from history. How would you feel if you had that opportunity? A few years ago, I had an opportunity to meet somebody who I admired and it perhaps didn't go exactly how I planned. A famous drummer, a guy called, uh, is like a jazz drummer. I'm a, a huge fan of him, a guy called Brian Blade. Me and my friend, we find out that he's playing at Ronnie Scott's, not too far from here. And we both get tickets. He was kind of playing in a band with somebody else. I'm like, man, we get to f- I get to finally see this guy play in the flesh. And as I, uh, before the kind of gig starts, I, I go downstairs to use the bathroom. I open the door and lo and behold, who is there at the sink brushing his teeth? But, but my, my drumming idol, my drumming hero. 
And I, what do I do? I'm like, I, and I was obviously too scared to say anything. So I just kind of went to the toilet and washed my hands in the other sink and kind of went back upstairs, you know, because I'm just like, what? It's just, it, that is, you know, just not what you would expect to kind of meet your hero in, in just like in the bathroom. Anyway, I did get to meet him afterwards and have a little chat. And he was a cool guy. He was a cool guy. But in some ways, it was, it, there was part of it kind of, you meet the guy and you realize he is just a normal guy. Um, and sometimes I think, you know, we can often idolize kind of when we obviously are, are idols. I guess that's why we call them idols. But think about the excitement of meeting somebody you, you really want to meet. But then also when you actually meet them, it doesn't disappoint. And then think about, maximize that. We should be even more excited about the idea of coming face to face with God. I mean, the God of the universe, the God who created everything. And imagine meeting him face to face. How would you feel? What would you want to say to him? Moses has this privilege, this, this kind of intimate relationship with God. Because the, the God of the Bible is relational. He speaks to his creation. He interacts with his creation and not just with Moses, but with us too. This same God invites us into relationship with him. And that is the whole reason why Jesus came. It is the whole reason why he came to come to earth, to die on the cross in our place. It was all because of relationship. It says this in Romans chapter 5, verse 10. It says this, for if... While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Once again, Paul takes up that same theme again in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, where he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. These verses, they're full of relational language. Jesus came, he died for us and rose again to restore us to relationship with God, to reconcile us to God and restore that which sin had broken. And as we are reconciled to God, we then get the chance to be reconciled to others. And this is Moses, this is the guy, Moses, who is marked by his relationship with God but it's interesting because did you notice there was somebody else in that scene as well? Where it said, in what we just read, Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And when Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant, Joshua the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. The other man in that scene is Joshua. And I think it is no surprise that God would choose him to take the place of Moses, a man who also treasured relationship with God to the point that even after God would finish speaking to Moses in the tent of meeting, Joshua would remain. Such was his desire just to be near the presence of God. Now Moses has led the people out of Egypt, out of slavery, but it is now Joshua's job to lead them into the land, to lead the people of Israel, to lead this new generation into the land that was promised all those years ago to Abraham. And I want you to think of that is, that is the background to what we're about to read now. Joshua is now taking over from Moses who has been the the, the physical and spiritual leader of the people. And it says this in verse 1 of what we read, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, 
the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. After Moses dies, God speaks. It's a simple and yet profound truth. God speaks to Joshua. He doesn't leave him to figure this out on his own. He personally talks to him. And you can imagine the initial comfort that Joshua must have experienced in that moment to have God himself speak to him. Joshua could easily begin to think, man, I'm on my own now. He could easily begin to doubt whether God would speak to him and guide him just as God had done with Moses. But God chooses not to leave him in that space. He chooses not to leave Joshua. He, doesn't, he, he wants Joshua to know without a doubt that just as he was with Moses, he's going to be with him. And often when we see this and, and other moments in the Bible where God speaks to people, we can, we, we can often find ourselves saying, man, I wish God would speak to me, right? And if we find ourselves in that frame of mind, we need to remind ourselves of the truth because we can easily think, well, God used to speak to people then, but he doesn't really do it now. But the truth is that God continues to speak today. And it may not be through an audible voice, although he's more than capable of doing so. But the way in, the, the, the way in which he has primarily chosen to communicate with his people today is just as powerful, it's just as truthful, it's just as firm, and it's just as reliable, and it's through his word. It's through his word, it's through this book we have here that God chooses to speak to us. One pastor, a guy called John Piper, he explains it this way, he says, oh, how precious is the Bible. It is the very word of God. In it, God speaks in the 21st century. This is the very voice of God. By this voice, he speaks with absolute truth and personal force. By this voice, he reveals his all-surpassing beauty. By this voice, he reveals the deepest secrets of our hearts. No voice anywhere, anytime can reach as deep or lift as high or carry as far as the voice of God that we hear in the Bible. And perhaps the reason we fail to hear the voice of God is because we fail to open his word. We fail to see just how precious this book is. A book like no other that has ever been written because it is the very word of God. And as we see in the text, God then continues to say this to Joshua. He says this, Moses my servant is dead. And now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. And every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised to Moses. You see, as God gives Joshua his orders, we are reminded that God is a God who keeps his promises. Unlike us, when God makes a promise, he keeps it. You see, the nation stands on the edge of the promised land, and God says to Joshua, look, just as I promised to Moses, I'm going to give you this land, trust me. And it is yet again, it's another reminder, God is a God who keeps his promises. Look at what Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19, where he says this, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter amen to God for his glory. You see, when God gives us a promise, he always keeps it. His promises are always yes, and our response is simply to be amen. His promise to, his promise to be with us and never forsake us. We say yes and amen to forgive and restore us, to use all things for our good, to provide a way of escape in moments of temptation, to one day return and take us to be with him forever to one day wipe away every tear 
we say yes and we say amen. Those are just a few promises which only skim the surface of that which God has promised us, that which God has promised his children. And the list goes on and on. And if you ever begin to doubt them, if you ever begin to doubt the promises of God, God says, look to the cross. God says, look to Jesus. Because it is through him all the promises of God find their yes. He is the ultimate proof that God always keeps his promises. Just as the song, which is kind of written, inspired by that verse, the song Yes and Amen, where it says, Faithful you are, faithful forever you will be. Faithful, yes you are. All your promises are yes and amen. I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. And God invites us to find our rest in his promises, our confidence, not in our ability, but in his faithfulness, not in our faithfulness, but in his. And he is inviting Joshua to do the same. So imagine what must be going through Joshua's mind, right? His, his leader, his mentor, his friend has just passed away and now he is responsible for the well-being of a whole nation. It is his job to lead the thousands and thousands of people that make up the nation of Israel into this new land, this occupied land. How would you feel in that situation? If somebody turns to you and say, hey, see this nation in front of you? That's your job now. That's your responsibility. I want you to lead this nation. I mean, I can only, I mean, put yourself in that situation. I can only imagine how I would feel. And I've been waiting for this moment to get a superhero reference in here, and I'm going to bring it in. Even in, think of it, I think this is actually quite a helpful way of understanding this tension, which we even see in the one of the most recent record-breaking superhero films, Black Panther. Yeah, you didn't think I could get it in a sermon, but I definitely could. And if you remember watching the film, you haven't seen it, it's a good film, not like I'm necessarily saying go and see it, but go and see it. <laughs> and in the film, basically, um, Black Panther, the main character, T'Challa, his, his job is basically in the wake of his father's death, it is now his job to become king. And in this kind of weird vision moment he has with his father, he, there's this kind of vision he has of his father, and he's speaking to his father, and he says to his father, look, I'm not ready. And his father replies, have you not spent so many years by my side watching and learning and preparing for this day? And T'Challa replies, that is not what I meant. I'm not ready to be without you. You know, granted, Moses wasn't Joshua's dad, but I imagine he would have been a figure who he looked up to, maybe even like a father type kind of figure, someone who he had spent many years by his side watching and learning and preparing. And it's easy to think, okay, yes, he, he would have been going through these motions of being prepared, seeing how Moses led and being ready to lead. But then there is that sense of, but now I'm actually without you, Moses. Would, would he have been not only struggling with the enormity of the task, but also struggling with, man, Moses used to be the guy I used to turn to. Moses used to be the guy I went to for counsel. Moses used to be even just my friend, and it, just him being present with me. And you can imagine just the anxiety, the fear, the doubt, and these may have been some of the things just wrestling through his mind. We can't see specifically in the text. It doesn't say specifically in the text what was going through his heart and mind, but God knows exactly what's going on. God looks at us. He doesn't see our exterior. He sees our heart. He knows how Joshua is feeling. He knows how to respond, and he responds accordingly. And he says this, Joshua, look, no man, verse 5, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Why? Why is it that nobody will be able to stand before him? He says this, just because just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or 
forsake you. I want you to think for a second, what, in what ways God was with Moses? How do we see God present and at work through the life of Moses? Well, from the very beginning, from the moment he was born, we see God providentially saving him from death as a baby. We see God speaking to him in the burning bush. We see God working through Moses to liberate his people. We see him parting the Red Sea through Moses. We see God providing food and water in the wilderness for Moses and the people. We see God with Moses defeating enemies and the list goes on and on. And we can think about all the incredible different ways that God was with Moses. And we're reading about, we could read about, we, when we read about such events, we're left amazed. But Joshua actually witnessed many of these events firsthand. He is an eyewitness to how God was with Moses. And now God promises to do the same for Joshua. I will never leave you, Joshua. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm not going to turn my back on you. I'm not going to run away from you, Joshua. And what an amazing promise. The God of the universe promises to be present with Joshua. He promises to never leave him. He promises not to bail on him or to throw him away, to cast him away. And what a promise he gives to Joshua. And the, and the question is, would you, I mean, would you want such a promise? Would you like God himself to be with you and to never forsake you? Because the truth is we can experience that promise too. As Christians, when we give our lives to Jesus, we enter into that same promise. We read it this, and I'm, the, God gives this promise to us in Hebrews, where it says in Hebrews chapter 13, 5 to 6, it says this, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. I mean, that is a very good statement in itself. I mean, that's something to definitely learn from. <laughs> but then he says this, for he has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So we confidently say, the Lord is my helper I will not fear what can man do to me. For the Christian, we have this hope which gives us confidence in the midst of the most difficult of circumstances that God, our helper, is with us and he will not leave us and he will never forsake us. And this is all possible through Jesus. Uh, a pastor, a guy called Paul Tripp, explains it this way, where he says this, Remember that the most difficult moment of suffering, or sorry, the most difficult moment of the suffering of Jesus on the cross wasn't physical, it was relational. It was that moment when the father turned his back on the son and Jesus in relational torment, cries out, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabaphani, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he says, this, hear what I'm about to say. Jesus took every ounce of your rejection so that you would never again see the back of God's head, but rather you can run to him. You see, Jesus was forsaken for us so that we would never have to be forsaken. Jesus saw the back of the Father so that we would never have to see the back of the Father. And because of Jesus, we can now run to the Father and be embraced by him. God tells Joshua all of these things, all of these promises he gives to Joshua. Of what we just read, I'm giving you this land. Every place your foot treads, I'm going to give you. No man's going to be able to stand against you, Joshua. I'm going to be with you just like Moses. I'm not going to leave you, Joshua. I'm not going to forsake you, Joshua. He gives him all of these promises. And then after these promises, he then gives him this call. He says this in verse 6, where he says, Be strong, and courageous for you shall cause this people to inherit the land I swore to their fathers to give them why why do you think God is telling him to be strong and courageous 
Is it not? Surely it's because the task ahead is a difficult one. It's going to be a task that's going to require strength and a task that's going to require courage. Following Jesus will come with its difficulties, its challenges and even its dangers at times. To be... To truly be a Christian, it's going to require courage. It's going to require strength. It's going to be difficult, but it's ultimately going to lead to life. Jesus himself said this in Matthew's Gospel, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. The path which Jesus lays out for his followers is not the, it's not the easy option, but it is the option that leads to life. It will often be easier to follow the ways of the world around us. It will be easier to follow the, the, the people and the pressures of people around us. It's going to be harder at times to put God first and to follow him. And what I've often heard some people say is this, do not settle for the path of least resistance, but instead follow the path that leads to life, follow the path that Jesus calls you to. And this is the path that Jesus, that God himself, is laying out before Joshua. He continues to say in verse 7, where he says this, only be strong and courageous, be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Once again, God says, be strong and courageous. And then he turns Joshua's attention to God's word, the book of the law, and the commands given by God to the people through Moses. It is what perhaps we would know today as the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. God tells Joshua that as he leads the people, that his success is dependent on whether he will stand firm on the word of God. This, this, this book which we have in our hands. And I don't want you to miss what God is saying here. He said that this is no mere book. This is the very word of God himself. And he says, look, do not depart from this, Joshua. And in a culture which, we, which constantly tries to discredit and belittle this book. And as we are surrounded by a culture that constantly calls us away from it, I want to echo the words of God to Joshua as he says, don't turn from it. Don't turn from God's word. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left. Do not turn from his word, but rather read his word and know his word and meditate on his word. Love his word because in its pages we meet face to face with God himself. Within its pages we find life. Jesus himself says in Matthew 4 verse 4, it is written, and this is Jesus quoting from the Old Testament, he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And in what areas of your life are you being tempted to turn away from the word of God? Is the word of God quick on your mouth? Are you choosing to meditate meditate on it day and night to think about it as you wake up, to think about it as you go to sleep? And God says to Joshua, as he says to us, you need the word. You need this book. You need the word of God in your life. And God continues and he finishes this little section and he says this, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the lord your god is with you wherever you go 
This is the third time with only, with only a few verses that God once again tells Joshua to be strong and courageous. He's, he's bringing home this point, isn't he? He's like, be strong and courageous. Oh, and also be very strong and courageous. And have I not commanded you, Joshua? Be strong and courageous. And, 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 and he continues to bring home this point, And then he brings the why. After saying again and again, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, he then gives us the why. The reason why we don't have to be afraid. The reason why he, he doesn't have to be frightened. The reason why he has every, every reason to be strong and courageous. And he says to he says, Joshua, look, this is why you don't need to be afraid. This is why you have every reason to be strong and and courageous and it is one simple truth which fuels everything that we've seen in the in the earlier verses verses which is this the lord your god is with you wherever you go god says to joshua i'm with you joshua i'm with you find your strength in me find your courage in me as i lead you to this promised land. I don't, as you hear those words, be strong and courageous, I don't want you to separate that from God's promise to be with us. Because we could easily think that. We could easily just think God's being like, hey, you just need to be stronger. You just need to be more courageous. I mean, come on. You know, stop being so frightened. God doesn't just say that and just walk off. and then, I'll see you later. You work on that and I'll come back once you're a bit more tougher. But rather God says, no, you have every reason to be strong and you have every reason to be courageous because it's me who is with you it is because it's, i'm the one who's going with you and i'm and it's going to be me who is going to be fighting on your behalf you see as joshua steps out in faith we will see god do amazing things through joshua we see him have amazing victories but we will still see joshua fail at times and we will certainly see the people of Israel fail at times. They will fail to be strong and courageous. And the truth is, as commendable as Joshua was, he isn't perfect, but rather he is a foreshadow pointing us to a greater Joshua to come. Uh, it says this, um, a guy called J.D. Greer explains it this way when talking about Joshua. He says this, so... This is being Joshua being a foreshadow of a greater Joshua to come. He says this, so another Joshua would one day come and he would give us the courage to obey all the way because this Joshua would show us in even clearer ways that he was fighting for us. The city that stood in our way was not Jericho, it was the city of our sin and the curse of death. And Jesus, which is simply Greek for Joshua, said, don't lift a finger. I'm going to take it down. There's nothing you can do. I'm going to do it for you. And then Jesus will go to a cross and, he will, and when, he, when he dies, he's going to, when he died, he shouted. And when he did, he knocked down not the walls of brick and mortar, but the wall of eternal separation from God. The sword of our judgment that he carried in his hand, he turned on himself, placed it into his own heart. And he said, just watch and believe and shout in worship. And that's what it means to become a Christian. You shout, I believe you paid for my sin, Lord Jesus. And when you do, the wall separation between you and God falls down. You see, Joshua is a, full, a foreshadow of our greater Joshua to come, Jesus. Jesus, who would be foolish, who would, who would display the strength we could never display and the courage we wish we had, who would be willing to take us into that promised land, who would defeat our enemies, who would take down that which stood in the way of us knowing him, and that was our sin. So as we are challenged, as we are reminded through this text, of first, first of all, that following Jesus will come with its difficulties, it will come with its challenges. 
But as you really think about that, let us not forget, but rather remember that Jesus himself promises to go with us. And Jesus himself promises to be our strength and to give us the courage. He simply desires us to come to him, to acknowledge our need of him, to acknowledge he's with us. And as we, as we, as we remind ourselves, as we continually preach to ourselves that he is with us, that he is for us, I think by his Holy Spirit, he will then give us the strength and the courage that we need to face the challenges. Because of, our, because of Jesus, our greater Joshua, we have no need to be afraid. We have no need to be dismayed. But instead, we have every reason to be strong and courageous. And it's all because of Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you, first of all, for this, this challenge to be strong and courageous. Lord, I thank you that you were willing to meet with Joshua, most likely in a, in a moment where he, he felt fearful. He saw the challenges ahead of him, and I have no doubt there would have been a wrestle with fear and, and anxiety and doubt. And I thank you, Lord, that in those moments you met him there. And you spoke to him. And, you, and what did you speak to him? You spoke promise to him. And Lord, I want to pray the same for us. If we find ourselves where we are in a place of fear and doubt and anxiety, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would remind us and speak to us your promises. Because as this text also reminds us, you are a God who keeps his promises. Lord, and we want to thank you for the promise that, you, that promise that you give us, which is to be with us. To be for us, with us through the difficulties and the challenges that we face. Jesus, we want to say thank you, Lord. And, and may that knowledge, may that truth, may those promises, as we meditate on those promises, may they, may they give us hope. May they give us the strength and the courage which we can only find on you. And forgive us for those moments where we try to be strong and courageous without you. But rather help us to realize that true strength and true courage is not found on, on, on our own, but rather it's found in and through and with you. And as we go away today, Lord, if we are in that position where we're doubting your promises, may we look to the cross. Because at there, there's, there is the perfect display of your love for us the perfect display of your promises to us. Thank you, Jesus, that you would die in our place. Thank you that you would show ultimate strength and ultimate courage in defeating sin once and for all, defeating the sin that stood in our way of you. And now we thank you, Lord, that you've torn that down. You've defeated sin so that we can know you, so that we, like Moses, can know you, God, as face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Lord, you are a relational God, Lord. And I pray that as we leave here, we would be inspired to know you more, inspired to, inspired to spend more time with you, inspired to be in your word, because in your word we see you, in your word you speak to us. Jesus, thank you for all that you've taught us and spoken to us through this text. And Lord, I, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you will enable us to live this out in our lives, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.